Well, Ariella, what do you got? Yeah, speaking the of the social safety net. Yeah. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about the push to vaccinate prisoners during the COVID crisis. And when I was looking into this, you know, Jacobins covered this, but surprisingly, the mainstream media has covered it quite a bit as well. So the U.S. has um, another exceptional record under its belt. The COVID cases have topped 23.6 million. Um, and as the vaccination continues to roll out across the country, people are making the case for early vaccination of prisoners. And this ranges from mainstream outlets like USA Today, the New York Times, the Washington Post, to state politicians, for instance, in Massachusetts, where they prioritize vaccination for inmates. And even the CDC recommends that inmates receive the vaccine in the first wave. Um, the COVID crisis has justifiably led to an increased concern around prisoners' health care, not simply because they are an exceptionally vulnerable population, but also because prisons and jails are acting as vectors for the spread of the disease. COVID outbreaks in prisons and jails also pose a unique risk to the surrounding hospitals, particularly in rural areas. How, how important is releasing prisoners to free up space as far as preventing the spread inside these facilities? It's a critical tool, and it's it's one that's being used effectively in, in many areas, but not enough. Uh, it's a critical tool because it allows us to get some of the most vulnerable people out of detention settings, people we know are at high risk for actually dying if they contract COVID-19. It's a critical tool, uh, as you mentioned, because it helps us manage the outbreak inside for everybody who's still there. So we can spread people out, uh, keep people in appropriate uh, housing areas and a safe, safer distance from each other. But it's also a critical tool because it helps us prevent local hospital systems from becoming overwhelmed. Uh, when the virus runs like wildfire through these facilities, uh, just in the space of a day or two, it can overwhelm a local hospital. And particularly for rural counties, where we have fewer and fewer hospitals because of hospital closures, but we have lots and lots of county jails, state and federal prisons, and ICE detention centers. Uh, when this virus takes hold in crowded facilities, it would it can completely overwhelm the sole uh, hospital that might be serving one or two counties uh, in the space of a day or two. Particularly in rural areas, there's been an increase in the amount of jails and prisons and a decrease in the amount of hospitals. And those areas are getting hit hard, particularly because they rely on those places as centers for employment. So you have people going in and out of those areas and then into communities that are underserved and underinsured and it's a recipe for disaster. Um, there's an urgent utilitarian, legal and ethical argument for taking drastic measures to prevent COVID from spreading in jails and prisons through early release, vaccines for all prisoners and staff and increasing the quality of food, living conditions and medical care, which hasn't had as much of a focus as the vaccination. And it's pretty um, offensive and horrible that even though there's an increased focus on the um, absolutely grim prospects for a person with COVID in a jail, we are not focusing also on the fact that their food, living conditions, and medical care are inadequate to begin with. There's been great coverage about public health prisons and COVID on the Jacobin website, and I encourage you to check out these articles. Um, they tackle the issue from a socialist perspective, which is what we need. We also need to be constantly expanding that perspective. Um, I think it's great that there's some, some consensus between the mainstream media right now and socialists. We should be vaccinating the most vulnerable. That includes people outside of the United States as well. And we'll bring that up with um, Zizek later. So the utilitarian case is strong and without controlling the spread in prisons, we risk the health of those inside and outside of their walls, which is abundantly clear in mainstream and indie coverage. The legal argument, is undeniable. Prisoners are the only people in the US that are constitutionally guaranteed the right to health care through the Eighth Amendment. And this is a right that they fought hard for since the 60s. But prisoners are being left alone to die in horrific conditions with absolutely no accountability from the system that has incarcerated them. The ethical argument speaks for itself. One in five prisoners has COVID. There are, that's around 3,000 uh, sorry, 343,000 people. And that's a higher positivity rate than many countries and many counties outside of those jails and prisons. So far, more than 1,700 people have died 
Um, here's a clip of Lewis Clark, an inmate at the Stateville Correction Facility, talking about conditions in the prison's quarantine unit. Guards moved him into a quarantine area known to inmates as Tent City. The shower is ice cold. All of the inmates with COVID-19 in Tent City is subject to use the same toilet sinks and showers. The conditions? Floor to be bloody with feces and urine. Lewis says are horrifying. The quarantine tent is infested with roaches. Lewis is from Rock Island. At the age of 14, he stole a car. At 16, he was charged with aggravated battery on a peace officer and sentenced to two years in prison. While behind bars, Lewis claims he was being targeted by fellow inmates and guards. They didn't keep him safe. Weapons were found in his possession. My brother did get caught with some weapons. And he was sentenced to an additional 29 years. And I have less than three years left on the last weapon case. Lewis is now suing the prison for failing to provide him with medical treatment. This court document alleges that he became a target of repeated retaliatory measures taken by Illinois Department of Corrections, such as cancelling his medical appointments. They are acting with deliberate indifference to a prison condition and depriving the sick inmates of a basic need. The ethical case there is clear in terms of our moral uh, obligation to relieve suffering. When you hear a person talking about living in conditions like that, it's difficult to um, imagine that that's the case for millions of people across this country. But the socialist ethics of it are a little bit deeper. We have a moral right to science as the property of the people. We have a moral right to the resources that working people create for the good of working people. And we are not distributing them in a way that meets the mandate of the morality and the ethics of what working people have made. Um, the utilitarian and ethical cases for early release, vaccination and safe housing extend beyond this crisis. The coronavirus may have exposed the cracks and fissures that people fall through in this country, but it's also exposed our profound interconnectedness and our interreliance as a species. Just as COVID-19 spreads with no regard for criminality, class, or status, other communicable diseases do as well. There are record rates of HIV and AIDS in prison populations, record rates of hepatitis C, and you see this leach out into the communities that are around these places because people connect to each other. That's something that socialists need to defend. Just as COVID-19 has changed our focus on the right that prisoners have for health care, we need to look at the gaps that already exist in that system. Prisoners struggle to get adequate care through third-party contractors, overstretched staff, and even then, in at least 35 states, inmates have to pay co-pays that can range from a few dollars to a hundred dollars, while the work they do in prisons pays them pennies an hour. Healthcare is in no way a right if a person can't afford it, but that's the point, to discourage people from getting care, even in dire conditions. In addition, Medicaid coverage is revoked as soon as a person is booked in jail, regardless of whether or not they've been convicted. But despite this, prisons and jails act as a de facto treatment center for addiction and chronic illness in many communities. In Carolyn Suffren's book, Jail Care, she looks at the way pregnant women use jail as a replacement for an inadequate and inaccessible safety net. And this is common for people with other conditions. The left has heavily criticized the use of police to solve social issues, and rightly so. But we need to extend the same criticism to the use of jails and prisons to treat the chronically ill, those suffering with addiction, or those who are simply unafford, unable to afford care in other places. And when people lose benefits like Medicaid after being booked, their families suffer and the cycle of poverty and pain continues. Here's a quote from a CNN story about a woman who lost coverage when she was put in jail. Quote, another Douglas County inmate, Julia Conger, is a single mother of four children who was jailed in January for unlawful possession of someone else's debit card. She, was, she had been supporting her kids with her disability benefits, and they also received health care through her Medicaid coverage, both of which ceased when Conger went to jail. When her sister took Conger's daughter to the dentist for a tooth problem, she was no longer covered. It's causing my daughter pain, Conger says, and it's terrible for me not being able to do anything. 
Prisoners' health also suffers when they're in jail, as does their families, and this creates a dynamic that lasts for years and does not stop once these people aren't incarcerated. They leave with higher rates of chronic illness and disease than any other population. Now, because of this highly contagious disease, the public safety issues posed by the, the treatment of prisoners are being cast in a new light, and that's good. We need the focus to be on the most vulnerable in this crisis because their vulnerabilities are ours. But mass incarceration is its own disease in many communities. Multiple studies show the effects of incarceration account for poor health outcomes, increased levels of mental illness, and higher mortality rates community-wide. Uh, this is a quote from a study that says, from the National Academics of Sciences, saying, quote, people leaving jail and prison typically return to communities characterized by poor health outcomes and limited access to primary care. Controlling for a range of factors that affect health, counties with higher incarceration rates have 3% higher mortality rates compared with the communities with lower incarceration rates. So yes, we urgently need early release. Yes, we need humane conditions for the duration of the pandemic and after. And yes, we need vaccines for all prisoners. But just as urgently, we need Medicaid expansion and ultimately Medicaid for Medicare for all. To deny prisoners care doesn't just affect them. And this is true for COVID, as true for COVID as it is for mental health, drug addiction, poverty, and chronic illnesses. We have an unprecedented moment where people at all levels of government and media are focused on the public health crisis in prisons and jails. And we need to expand that attention, make the case that the crisis doesn't just stop with COVID. The utilitarian argument and the ethical arguments here are one and the same. Yeah, when I, nothing causes me more despair about this country when thinking about, than when thinking about the, the prison system. I mean, it's just, it, it is such a barbaric, intolerable thing that it it that has just kind of become part of our lives like part it just it just it just is and and just when you think about the number of people the number of lives destroyed um the treatment of those people within it uh the the almost joking nature of the of the conditions within it like for a civilized society um few things make me despair more <laughs> than yeah. than thinking about it like it's just and and i can't even imagine what it must be like uh during covid i mean it 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 just has to be a nightmare in there yeah you know it was a little hard for me to do this segment it, it's just hard to listen to these prisoners and what they're experiencing but my niece was um in a kind of release house and then she got covid and she was put back in prison to serve two more weeks on her sentence right after she recovered from being on a ventilator there is a calcification of these policies kind of at every level and that also applies to um you know group homes or halfway houses often at times those are owned by the same companies as private prisons so Geo Group is um, a huge owner in private prisons, and they also own halfway houses, and they're denying release. They're, they're actually quarantining people in these halfway homes, parolees, and not letting them leave, not letting them speak to the media. There are COVID outbreaks there as well. That's receiving less um, coverage than the issue in prisons and jails, but it's just as serious and it's the same actors involved. And of yeah. course, the uh, ICE detention centers, where not only do you have a range of abuses around COVID, you have forced sterilization, medical procedures that women uh, have not had any consent to. And that's also um, a common feature of prisons and jails. It's just one of the most kind of bleak, despairing places, but we have a unprecedented moment of attention on it right now in this country where people yeah. are actually talking about it as a social issue rather than ignoring it or acting like it's an aberration. And I think we need to seize on that. Yeah. And the, the uh, and the, this thing that the Trump administration has done in the last couple months where they're just kind of speeding up the federal executions of uh, yeah. inmates on, on death row, which um, as I understand it, there hadn't been a, uh, federal execution in in a very long time in several years um 
you know, most of the executions that have happened occur at the state level. Um, and that just as soon as like they're about to leave, get out the door, they just speed up this federal execution system. And it's like the barbarity and humanity of it is, is it just makes me, like you said, it's absolutely bleak, um, makes me despair. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and it's, it's just the, the, the sort of violence that undergirds, um, all of our systems is just, I mean, I, what do you make of like, what do you, what do you think the role of it plays in the broader system, in the broader society, this, this like absolute brutality, um, of our prison system? Well, I think that there's two sides there. You know, I think with the Trump executions, he's trying to play to the, you know, law and order component of his base. Um, and so executions are a spectacular way of, kind of appealing politically to a group of people. Um, and we saw this with Clinton, we saw this with Bush. So it's not a huge departure there. Um, but I think in terms of the conditions of prisons, this is a disposable population. Um, and you see a very different dynamic when the state is dealing with someone who is an oppressed person and who um, whose oppression they rely on, right? And someone who is, um, you know, in, in the working class who has some some amount of leverage. So with prison populations, you have an unprecedented amount of control over people. You have a population that um, exists within a narrative that they don't deserve certain rights, and that um, this is satisfying like a general punitive desire. Right, it's indulging that, and you see that um, unfortunately when people talk about this issue or other issues with prisoners, or even the federal executions. Well, you got what you deserved, but then you hear a story like we heard with Lewis Clark, who seemed to have committed minor offenses, or a woman who used another person's debit card, which I'm sure, you know, in my opinion, that's not a big deal. It seems no. like this woman was suffering and she needed money, and the state yeah. wasn't providing that, and there's no options. Um, and I think that's the case with millions of people. But uh, we have a society that criminalizes poverty and pulls a huge portion of its citizens outside of their um, the normal scope of their rights. And it does so yeah. purposefully. And I think that you can see mass incarceration as a method of managing poverty, um, mm -hmm. managing, redirecting resources from the many to the few. Yeah. 